All right, roll call is taken. Uh, approval of the minutes of the 11, 13, 19 regular meeting. Those are in your packet. Uh, move to approve. I'll second. Any comments, corrections, or changes? Uh, hearing none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The motion carries. Approval of police department bills. Chief. Good morning. Uh, one set of bills in front of you, uh, signed by Commissioner Gershman on the 18th. A couple things to bring to your attention. Uh, 4B, a couple final charges from some squad switchovers. We had left most of our squad switchovers towards the end of the year because of some low miles on our uh, police vehicles. So that allowed us to delay some of those switchovers, but that's why you've seen a little bit more charges come through in the last uh, month or two. 4C, a couple of payments to Colorado State University. It's my final payment uh, towards my master's and uh, Assistant Chief Zepp's second to last payment. So he's, uh, I think, overflowing with excitement to be finished in the next Exciting year. times, exciting times. He's all flushed. And I am. Uh, 4E has a wheel repair for our um, armored rescue vehicle that was uh, performed at Mid-State Truck. And then 4F, uh, there's a bill to UW Oshkosh, um, which, um, which is uh, Lieutenant Esther's um, bachelor degree pursuit that uh, he's, he's going through. He should be done with that uh, within two years. So um, nothing else of significance to bring your attention. Be happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, look for your approval. Um, motion, please. Thank you, Marty. Second. Thank you. Any questions or comments about the bills, Mike? Well, the squad changeovers, and I understand that includes like electric stuff and everything, but the, with the decals and all that kind of stuff, is that what you expected to have cost every time we change over, or is it a concern that it's, for me anyhow, it's going to be a concern for the cost? Um, I know they look pretty and everybody does it, and, but I mean, it, you know, in a, in a, if it came down to a tight budget, is it something we'd end up continuing or is it important? Or I'd rather have them marked than unmarked, but. Right. Um, I, I think the, a lot of the, and Pat can speak to things that I leave out, but a lot of the costs come with uh, a lot of things outside of our control, uh, model year changes with the vehicles or uh, we buy a different vehicle because it's less expensive. So the savings that we have in a less expensive vehicle could um, cost in things that we can't reuse because of you know the dimensions inside of a squad. If we're putting a cage, most of our uh, squads have cages in the back, um, and uh, those are specific to that vehicle. You can't reuse one for a Ford and then for a Dodge or for a Chevy and such. So. Um, some of the equipment that we can reuse, we do reuse. Uh, we rely on our outfitter to let us know what is still good. Uh, a lot of times if something is no longer, um, if parts for it are no longer accessible because it has a five year shelf life and we're going into year five and it's going to be going into the squad for the next three years, they would suggest that that is replaced uh, just because it will have to be replaced if it fails over the next three years. And a lot of times when you're talking emergency vehicles and emergency lighting, uh, having that fail when we're en route to somewhere is not an option. So uh, things that we can control, we desire to control such as that. Uh, as it relates to the decals, um, yeah, we can't really reuse those. Um, I, would, I don't know if I'd use uh, pretty as, as the word to describe them, but um, there's some prettier ones out there. There's some more expensive decals out there. Ours are. Um, pretty, uh, I guess for the most part, uh, one, one thing that they do is they double as a protectant to the vehicle so the vehicle is not getting scratched and gouged with our equipment that we're taking in and out and such. So uh, it does have a twofold purpose, but is there anything I'd like to tell uh, <clears throat> The only thing I'd add is that when you talk about the squad switchovers, even from uh, different years of Tahoes to different years of Explorers, those cages might not fit. So the problem doesn't necessarily just come from switching car models. even the models of the same vehicle from year to year, uh, the cages won't fit. So there's there's cost there. Yeah, it's uh, it's something that unfortunately, years ago we used to perform those switchovers in-house. Um, and we had 
um, officers switching the cars over and it was uh, it was a mess and they didn't really know what they were doing and we figured with that high liability of, of exposure to responding to an emergency um, and, I, and I would assume that the fire department is from the same stance they would never do a switch over themselves when it came to equipment and uh, set up and everything uh, and we tried to do each squad even though they're different maybe makes and models as similarly as we can so that if you jump in one or the other everything's in the same place and, and you don't have to relearn the inside of the vehicle so that consistency is, is crucial to our officers so um, but yeah it does come at a cost. Other comments or questions for the chief? Mm -hmm. Do I have a motion? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, no additional comments or questions. Uh, we'll vote, and it's a roll call vote. Myers? Yes. Earl? Yes. Gershman? Yes. <laughs> Gershman? Yes. Yes. Please? Well, he didn't yeah. say yes yet. I said yes. Oh, you did? I did. Okay. Well, well, that's I did. Oh, yeah. Enthusiastically. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, the motion carries. Um, approval of fire department bills. Chief. Good morning. Uh, one Senate bill also um, signed by Commissioner Myers on November 15th. Uh, really, the only thing that uh, is noteworthy throughout all of the bills is there's several purchases for new engine three um, nothing that wasn't planned out um, with that purchase so other than that nothing else is really uh, out of the ordinary and, and with that I'd be happy to answer any questions and ask for your approval second please thank you <clears throat> Commissioner Myers questions or comments for the chief about the bills hearing none will vote Meyer yes Earl. yes me. <laughs> Go ahead, say it. Gershman, yes. <laughs> Keely, yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Are both of you uh, comfortable with where you are coming to the end of the year and the 2019 budget? You're all. I'll let you know in January. For the, <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> I'm going to take that as a yes and hold you to it. <laughs> Um, police department activities, training <coughs> reports, and correspondence back in. Chief Grant. Yes, uh, not an overly busy month, but still enough to uh, um, uh, to keep us running. Uh, a couple of trainings I'll bring to your attention. Myself and uh, Lieutenant Keffer attended an effective hiring practices training over in Chippewa Falls or Chippewa Valley Technical College in Eau Claire, I should say. Uh, it was put on by Yvonne Breezen and Roper. Uh, they are actually our labor attorneys uh, group and uh, they did a really good job in not only uh, giving suggestions on how to elicit better, stronger, more qualified candidates, but also just how to have a legally defensible hiring practice from pretty much the time you post the job offering to the point that um, you're onboarding the individual or um, going through um, the early stages of their first few days. So uh, it was a uh, one day training, uh, very full of information and, and um, I'm glad that we went. There was a Keeping Kids Alive conference that was actually held in Marshfield that uh, our school resource officer, uh, Julie Lou Martinic and our drug officer, Derek Iverson had, or drug detective, Derek Iverson had attended. That was put on by Jim Holmes. He's an investigator with the Department of Criminal Investigation and he focuses on um, child crimes, um, either homicides, sexual assaults, abuse of a significant nature. Uh, I've seen him present a couple of times. He's a great presenter and um, we had actually brought him to the community, I want to say maybe seven or eight years ago to present to central Wisconsin on, on investigating um, crimes against children. And uh, I was glad to see that he was able to come back. On the 20th, of November we had an honors committee meeting what this is is every year we give out awards to staff um, we've been looking at opening that up a little bit more to um, recognizing people in the community or other community partners that um, have made a difference in our past year 
so there's a couple of awards that uh, this committee has been talking about, um, you know, starting and and you know like a, um, we wanted to have not only a before it's always been an employee of the year. Well, we thought well it's necessary to have maybe an officer of the year and a employee of the year, and that would be from a non-sworn position. So we're giving out two of those awards and, and recognizing uh, those things. As far as the community goes, we're looking at maybe a uh, community partner or a citizen of the year, or maybe a um, journalist of the year award, just for those who are coming in and, and um, making a big difference and helping us um, with our um, vision to um, serve the community. We're also looking at uh, just various other awards that we could possibly you know, um, that would set it either an event or an individual apart and, and make them, uh, help them be recognized. And then lastly, on the 21st, uh, our school resource officer, Julie Lou Martinic, had uh, attended another week of Leadership Marshfield. She's uh, gaining a lot of information. This month is actually in December. It'll be the um, Public Safety Month where, where um, she'll be attending, you know, learning more about the fire department and then she'll actually be helping present in regards to the police department when the group goes over to uh, the PD. A couple of correspondence to bring to your attention on 6D, uh, Corey and Dixie Schrader uh, gave a donation of $500 uh, towards our annual meeting. Uh, they've been doing this for three years now uh, in memory of their son, Brock, uh, who had died a, a number of years ago. And um, they just want to do something um, to give back and, and they've actually sponsored our dinner the last uh, three years. So that's uh, very generous and we're very appreciative of that. On 6E, uh, we received a, a check from Clark County Sheriff's Department that was for equipment um, and resources expended during the loyal standoff. Uh, at one point we tried using um, CS and OC gas to, to get the individual to come out of uh, his residence uh, that he had barricaded himself in uh, that comes at a cost so um, we had talked to the Clark County Sheriff about uh, reimbursement for some of those charges and he was more than happy to um, reimburse us for the gas that we had expended at that scene. On 6F there was a payment that came in from uh, the fair uh, that usually comes in throughout the year just covering the security costs that uh, were offered during um, the Central Wisconsin State Fair. Then on 6H and I, uh, you'll see that there was reimbursements from uh, the sale of two, <coughs> two of our squads that went to auction that had high miles on them. And uh, between the two squads, we received $17,000, a little over. So be happy to answer any questions on those activities. Any questions? Mike? Uh, is there a question? It's more of a comment. <clears throat> but anybody who questions the need to have the school resource officer in the schools um, ought to double, th double think twice about it because uh, I, I think it's a value and I, what I want to stress is that I strongly believe that it's, these people are police officers first and a resource to the schools and then when the discussions come up whether who should pay for it, whether it should be the police department or the school district is without a doubt in my mind it's the police department's responsibility. We're very fortunate that we can put our people in the schools and we're getting to find that out just in the last couple of days again. How unfortunate is the kids have to go to school and with a threat hanging over their head. <clears throat> and to have those people on the spot is uh, it could very well turn out to be a good deterrent. And um, again, I think when it boils down to who's responsible to have those people in the schools, I think uh, without a doubt it's the, the police department. Um, because they're police officers 24 hours a day when they're needed. And uh, I, I think that uh, I'll probably stand on that all, you know, if ever discussion ever comes up again. Cause if it is ever a question of having them or not having them, I'll totally support having them. Thank you. Next mm -hmm. item on our agenda is hiring replacement. Lieutenant Larson. Yes. Um, so, <coughs> as, as I had brought to you last month, uh, 
Lieutenant Larson had submitted his uh, retirement papers. And uh, we had, I had just briefly brought up that we would be looking to replace his position. Um, if you recall, probably about uh, a little over a year ago, um, I had come to you asking if we could hire a replacement for, um, for Jesse Claha, who had been deployed um, overseas, and we were unsure of when his return would be at the time. It was kind of up, up in the air, really. We have since learned that um, he had come back to the States about uh, three weeks ago, that he actually comes back to Wisconsin, I believe this Friday, and he still has some training to complete, but he will be, um, from my understanding, the last conversation I've had with him was probably about a month and a half ago, but from uh, others who have been conversing with him, he has every intention of coming back to the police department. Uh, it could be as early as the first or second week in January. I hope to have more details uh, as that gets closer. But um, when he was deployed, you allowed us to hire his replacement that would put us one above our um, number of officers that we previously had, which was 40. That put us at 41 with Jesse being deployed. Um, and then the discussion was um, between his return and maybe another retirement maybe do a staffing study as to whether or not we need to maintain that 41st officer, maybe add additional or drop back to the 40. Um, seeing as how his return and uh, Lieutenant Larson's departure more or less coincide with one another, I think at this point we're just going to, um, again, assume that he's coming back until I hear otherwise. Um, he will just drop us back to that 40 position I still have intentions of doing a staffing study over the next year to see how we are um, in comparison to uh, what our needs are. But um, as long as Jesse does come back and it's in a timely fashion, uh, there shouldn't be a very large gap between, again, Darren's departure and his return. So um, at this point, I don't see the need to hire a replacement for Darren, um, but I'll keep you posted. I'll let you know if things change. When Jesse left, he had been with us for seven months. Uh, he's now been away from us for almost 14 months. So we're probably going to have to start from day one and retrain him uh, as though he was a brand new employee. Uh, some things he might catch on to uh, quicker based on his recollection from over a year ago. Um, but other things will you know, treat him as, as though a new employee if there is a challenge, the only challenge is, and this is a conversation that may have to happen with the union, uh, each employee has 12 months of probation, uh, which starts on their first day of employment and ends you know, at their one year anniversary. Uh, with Jesse B, so when we train somebody, we train them, uh, it takes probably four to five months to train them, and then we have a good um, you know, six to seven maybe eight months of evaluation to make sure that A, they're a good fit for the department and then that they're, um, uh, you know, they're confident and competent in their abilities. Well, with Jesse, if we have to start from, he's already put in seven months, which counts towards his probation. Now there's really five months left and it could take four months to train him. So we may have a smaller window of observation to be able to um, examine his effectiveness as an officer. Uh, where the union comes into play is we could ask for that probation to be extended for a year from his date of return. Uh, and that's a discussion that we may have to have at that point. So then we'll just have a good, I guess, um, opportunity to evaluate him and make sure that, um, you know, he's the best fit for the organization, the community that can be. Um, I would hate to make a rash decision one way or the other um, based on a very small sampling of, of his performance. So it's a um, matter of hanging in with the uh, 40 lines. Correct. Um, yeah. For now. Right. Yeah, and that's, uh, that was, uh, I remember the conversation. We didn't want to use this as a way to right. sort of backwards 41. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any comments or questions? Or I have a question uh, for the chief. Uh, do you intend to replace Lieutenant Larson internally uh, with someone, or are you going to advertise on the outside for that position? 
Well, initially, open it up internally. I mean, that's the plan. Uh, okay. Historically, we've filled those positions internally. Uh, I feel we have uh, many qualified candidates internally that uh, could perform um, in the role as lieutenant. I'm not exactly sure what we're going to do with that position of lieutenant. Uh, we have five lieutenants, one that supervises the detective bureau and one that supervises each patrol shift. Uh, although the detective bureau lieutenant's job is um, different, it's something that any lieutenant could perform. So we're in the process of uh, evaluating that, um, deciding if somebody could transfer, in, a current lieutenant could transfer into that um, detective lieutenant's position. Um, how that would look and um, how that would look with then filling a road lieutenant or if that um, that position you know is filled with somebody that's you know not currently a lieutenant so yeah that process will probably be happening over the next if I had to guess probably the next uh, three to four months and um, with uh, hopefully a promotion decision on a new lieutenant because we'll still because we're still have to fill that lieutenant's vacancy so on a pro promotion decision on that new lieutenant in the um, next few months thank you yep. Mr. I'm surprised that you're only recommending two people fill the position for the replacement for lieutenant Larson considering uh, all the effort he put in over over the years so I'm, I'm surprised <laughs> I'd be happy At least to that's what he told me. I'd <laughs> be happy to add another staff out of this. You're approving that. Yeah. As long as you don't have to prove that Lieutenant Larson did the work of two people for his. <laughs> we'll have to take that at face value. I wasn't here last month, and I'm sorry. <laughs> but I did want to say that with my regrets that he's retiring because I've gotten to enjoy working with him through the years, and he did a good job. Thank you. Yeah, anyone who likes cars as much as he does is okay with me. Um, next item on the agenda then is the residency conversation. Now I want to make a comment here. <clears throat> Peggy and I struggled with what word to use after residency. I want to chat. <laughs> and she thought that was too informal, so we went with conversation. Why don't you begin the conversation? Well, I handed out, I, I didn't um, duplicate it, but I had handed out at the last meeting uh, a summary of um, kind of the trends in, um, in recruitment and uh, efforts to, to recruit diverse applicants and some of the challenges in recruiting that we sometimes have in both our profession and I'm sure Fire can speak uh, to the same challenges with just that public safety um, recruitment. So we're always looking for ways to, um, I guess, elicit more interest, uh, both um, in qualified applicants and uh, maybe culturally diverse applicants uh, to this area. And a trend that's been happening uh, quite a bit, I actually had a printout on my desk and I forgot to grab it, which was all of the agencies, and I'd be happy to share that with you um, after this meeting. Uh, all of the agencies in Wisconsin that currently have um, no residency restrictions. Our current residency restriction is that you must live within 15 miles of the city limits um, as a crow flies. Uh, about, I think it's 60 days after probation. So by your 14th month of employment, the end of your 14th month of employment, you must live within 15 miles of the city. Uh, I think that this restricts our abilities at times to recruit qualified candidates or recruit more candidates. I think that uh, I, I believe that it inhibits our ability to, um, I guess, be a department of interest to culturally diverse applicants that are maybe living 30 miles away or 25 miles away and really have no interest in relocating but want a good job for a good organization. We were talking yesterday a little bit, and um, you can live 15 miles as a crow flies, maybe towards the west or southwest, be on a bunch of dirt roads, and it's gonna take you maybe 30 to 40 minutes to drive to the police department, or you could live 25 miles um, as a crow flies to the east, maybe a half mile off of Highway 10, and it takes you 
25 to 30 minutes. So I mean, you actually, you're living further out, but you're getting to um, your place of employment or the city faster, really based on where you live um, in conjunction with certain streets or roads or pavements, um, roads that are plowed sooner than others in the winter. So what I was asked last month was to, um, I, I believe uh, Commissioner Meese had asked me to just give some pros and cons to um, <coughs> residency and um, if we chose to get rid of the 15 mile radius and extend it to either unlimited or extend it to 30 miles or, or whatever um, the interest lies, it would be my suggestion that we just get rid of it. I don't believe anyone is going to live two or three hours away from their place of employment. Um, I don't see that as being um, reasonable in my mind or in theirs. Some of the pros that I had listed was a more diverse applicant pool. Um, it allows for applicants with families to consider employment without a geographic move. Uh, we had had an individual from a neighboring agency that um, had a desire to work for us, um, but based on the fact of his wife having a good job and him not wanting to uproot his children, um, that 30 mile, um, well, he was 30 miles away, having to move 15 miles closer to us um, was not worth the hardship it would cause his wife to now have to drive further and to have to relocate their children to a different school district. So um, that's just one example of, um, you know, whether somebody's driving from Clover or Rapids or Point or even, you know, yeah, Nielsville. Uh, yeah. Pat's wife works in Medford and drives there every day. So I mean, there's, it's not, I think, as, as abnormal as maybe it was 20, 30, 40 years ago as far as commuting um, to your employment. Um, I listed it's a healthy break from the community for officers who are patrolling the streets 12 hours a day. Um, I know when I lived 14 miles south of town for a number of years, um, it was nice to kind of just get out of the city when you spend so much time in the city um, doing police work and, and responding to calls for service and such. Um, I still like being part of the city and I mean we moved into the city, uh, but um, it, was, it was nice to, to be out at times too, um, especially after a hard day and such. And then. Uh, Removal uh, may allow for removal of the residency may allow for a workforce that's more representative of the community, which includes citizens and visitors. Um, I've seen many um, Latino stores and shops going up in the community, and I think that uh, you see on a daily basis uh, many visitors from outside of our community that are of um, you know Spanish-speaking populations, um, but yet they're not living necessarily in our community. Um, and I know that there's many other departments that are our size or larger that are successfully recruiting those individuals and some of those uh, departments have no residency so if somebody chooses to live closer to family and drive again 30 or 40 minutes or 30 or 40 miles uh, for their work um, for their work efforts um, that's not again a, an abnormal I guess feat some of the cons that I listed was uh, the potential for a delayed response time um, if you're calling in additional staff. Uh, this could happen if somebody's shopping up in Wausau though and they need to come in for um, an emergency or an overtime shift or if they're um, you know, maybe not at their home currently. Um, inclement, inclement weather delays are, are a possibility. Um, that's something we all have to take into account even for those that are living within the 15 miles of the city and have to take weather into account. The expectation would still be that they show up to work on time. And then the potential to negotiate and contract. Um, what I had, I had brought this up at the last uh, police and fire meeting. Uh, the city administrator had mentioned um, that he had felt that this was something that um, since it's in the contract, it should be negotiated out of the contract because it might be worth something to the union. Um, I guess I'm pursuing this. The union didn't ask me to come forward and pursue this. Um, I don't foresee off the top of my head any union members moving 30 miles further away because of if this residency restriction is lifted. Um, but I do see the potential of individuals um, you know, who are maybe being hired or coming to the community uh, to work for the police department uh, of that potential having, uh, you know, choosing to live um, outside of that 15 mile area if the residency is lifted. Um, in the end, I'm just going to finish in the end, I, I think that there's 
more benefits to the police department in removal of this residency restriction than there is um, benefits to keeping it. Conversation. I, I guess I'm curious, uh, is the same thing true with the fire department? Would you prefer that um, you'd be able to hire someone who lived a distance away? Or doesn't it matter as much? With um, for us, I, I think it's a double-edged sword for us. And, and I say that because would we recruit more people? Probably. I mean, I've already been told uh, very similar to what Rick had said that, you know, I'd love to come work for you, but I don't want to move um, closer. Uh, we have so many call-ins every day uh, for ambulance standbys. It's hard enough getting people to come in already that live in and around the city. Um, you know, yesterday we had um, a transfer uh, and we could only get one person and we needed two, so we ended up working short. Um, and that's becoming uh, common. So I think having uh, a greater residency in that regard um, would hurt us. Um, you know, years ago when we got a structure fire uh, and we did an all call, it was not uncommon for most everyone to show up. Now we're lucky if we get um, you know seven or eight people coming in. Uh, we're relying more on mutual aid now because we're not getting the people to come in. So. Um, as far as recruitment, I think it would definitely open it up. Um, I know Wisconsin Rapids had 15 uh, mile radius as well. Uh, they just completed a special hiring process and they extended it out to 30 uh, because they too are having recruitment issues. Um, you know, I, I can go either way. Um, I don't know that any of our current members, you know, would move out further, um, but I never say never because guys are always moving different places and if they can go further, they may. Uh, I know it is um, just talking contract. It is in our contract as well. Um, and uh, I'm not 100% sure where, where they stand on that. Uh, but that's just kind of our, you know, I, I know there are several fire departments in the state that uh, don't have residency. Most of the ones that are in our hiring consortium through CBTC have um, a 15 mile. And, you know, again, it's where are we pulling applicants from uh, and, and stuff like that. So, I mean, I, I can go either way. Um, and I haven't had a, a lengthy conversation with shift members other than what is that, what is that on the agenda? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so. It's a conversation. It's a conversation. Yes. <laughs> Mike, you were about to say something, I think. Uh, yeah. I'd like to hear some other stuff. <laughs> I've, I've given a lot of thought, but I, I'm leaving it open to see where the conversation leads. Anyone else have a comment to make? I, I think initially I, I didn't like the idea of extending the distance, but part of it, I think when you think hard about it, if we were in a metro area, a 15 mile commute could take 45 minutes. <laughs> you know, if you're in like Madison or Milwaukee. <clears throat> so I think from my perspective, I don't think it's a big deal. Uh, I think at one time this commission felt like if, if you work for this community, you need to be part of it. Well, I, I think we have to change our thinking a little bit. I, I, I just don't have a problem with us extending the distance. I, you know, and also I think. Uh, you know, the chief is going to have some discretion if somebody lives an hour and a half away. I mean, obviously, that would be a discussion. <laughs> you know, how is this really going to make sense? So, I, I have, I, I really don't have an issue with doing away with it. Um, I, I think, in some cases, we probably could attract more diverse applicants than we've had in the past, and that's something that we've talked about as a commission to have it more reflective of our, our uh, community. So. I, I, I'm not against changing it. I, I just in terms of like attendance policy, so the inclement weather, that's like the biggest thing, right? So you can't get to work. Um, what, 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 what happens if you can't get to work because you live too far away? You 
have to take a unscheduled paid time off? Um, is it a get here when you can? Is it soft? Is it hard? I don't know what the... Yeah, I guess it all depends on staffing levels. Uh, if we were at minimum staffing and um, that individual is putting us below minimum staffing, then we may have to hold somebody over until that individual can come in to work. Uh, you know, again, the expectation is um, if if they're say 25 miles out, and it normally takes them 40 minutes to drive to work, maybe they need to, you know, leave an hour early or or something. And that's a expectation or responsibility that them being as a you know a professional and an adult that we would put on anyone. Um, and being aware of what the road conditions are and such, uh, especially when that's part of your job is, is driving around and responding to the calls for service on the road. So uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, if, they, if there was a delay in their response, um, I mean, we have an attendance policy, uh, you know, the expectation would be set out um, if it would, uh, I mean, they'd have to either take some paid time off to cover that gap, um, Potentially something else, you know. I mean, I, I guess it, it could, if if it's getting to be chronic, it could be disciplinary in nature, uh, as as it related to that. So it all it all depends. Um, I know there was times when I lived, like, like I said, 14 miles out. I um, I would leave 40 minutes early for work, and I would get to the city limits. And I remembered that uh, I brought my uniform home to wash it the night before, and it's sitting in the dryer. So I'd have to turn around and I'd have to drive back. And there was an inconvenience at times with. With that, I know that others have been, um, you know, tasked with that inconvenience at times, and that's um, so it made me change the way I did, did things, and always kept uh, two spare uniforms in my locker that were clean just in case uh, I needed to take one home. So it was just a matter of being better prepared and better equipped for um, that choice I made to live further out. Can I have just one follow-up question? Is there any consequence of changing it that you can think? I mean, I'm trying to think, you know, Jen had a good question in terms of people showing up for work, especially if we have some weather event. Well, I would like to think our weather forecasters are getting better than it was in the early 1900s, but do you see any consequence adversely affecting the department if we did away with it? Other than the couple that you mentioned. Yeah, I, I really don't. Um, as, as Scott said, you know, I mean, it is... Um, for us, I would say that probably half of our, and I, I'd have to count out, but I'm guessing probably about half of our staff live outside of the city already. Um, you know, the, we've gotten better as, as a department, and at least, I mean, if we need officers to be called in, um, we'll never have an all call where everybody comes in because we're going to have to relieve those individuals after four, six, eight hours anyway. So, I mean, um, our all call would be, you know, probably um, using mutual aid, but then also maybe calling in, you know, five to ten officers, and um, you know, there's there's times when we call those individuals who are the ones that never say no to coming in and always have a tendency to come in and you know work overtime when they need to work overtime. Um, when it comes to um, the challenges with when it comes to the challenges with uh, um, anybody coming in, I guess uh, we're going to have individuals who don't want to work outside of their normal work hours. Right. Um, but I don't think that's going to change again based on somebody living five to 10 miles further out than, than what we're allotting right now. Uh, just to throw out there some of those departments, I have it up in front of me now, that are close to our um, population size that don't have residency or have a larger residency than what we have. Um, Hudson Police Department has a 20 mile. Um, River Falls has no residency. Um, Everest Metro, which is like Schofield Weston area, has no residency. Um, Menominee Police Department has 45 miles. Campbellsport and Germantown, Middleton, Grand Chute, Muskego all have no residency and they're right around that 20,000 population. Menominee Falls, Beloit, New Berlin, La Crosse, Oshkosh all have no residency. Um, there's some that do something unique. They say that the police chief has to live within uh, 10 miles of the city. Um, those are often some of the smaller organizations. 
that um, maybe the police chief gets in a vehicle and, and makes traffic stops and is more of a working, road working, call taking police chief. I think you said it right. Working? Yeah. Um, there's some that require SWAT officers and canine officers to live within a certain radius, but then anyone else can live wherever, and that's a responsibility they're taking on because maybe the frequency of them being called in is um, more urgent or pressing, and when we need them, we need them like now. So that's the only other discrepancy that I've seen really by other agencies. Um, otherwise, there's, I would say it's probably split 50-50, maybe even a little higher to the side of 60-40 um, with agencies that have no residency compared to those that have a residency. A lot of the smaller agencies don't have a residency just because they're not gonna, they have, are so challenged with recruiting anyways that they thought, well, so. Mike, I know you have talked about this and we're running time as an issue. Oh, I, the chief and I have had a conversation about this and um, and I brought up all the, the traditional, um, you know, through the years it's always been Actually, at one point it was, uh, you know, it had to live in the city. We, the, the cities actually let people go from the department because they couldn't meet the residency. And I, um, good people, very good individuals, and they just couldn't make the move and they had to, be, had to let them go. And I didn't agree with that at that time and I, you know, I think it is a bit of a restraint when we're trying to be a little more diverse. Um, I think all the arguments in my mind have been made that it, it, the only thing that hangs out there for me yet is maybe the command people, but or the the higher the um, hierarchy in the department. But you know that's traditional too, and I, I'm just trying to show I can, I'm capable of change. Um, <laughs> I, my dad worked for the city for 36 years and had to live in the city, and I know he would have probably liked to have gone out. In the country, or but um, you know, again, times change. We're a more mobile community than we are than we were 50 years ago. Um, everybody's got at least two cars, so I mean, it. There's not an argument to keep a residency requirement, so I'm I'm, I'm inclined to go along with removing it completely. Well, I tell you, it seems to me we've had our conversation. I would suggest that if the chief wants to move forward with this, you bring a, it'd be a policy change, wouldn't it? Yeah, I'll, I'll look into it and I'll, whatever I need to bring forward, I'll, I'll bring for the next Yeah, time. bring it to us and then we'll give you a decision. Okay. And I think you've got some sense of what the group feels. Uh, I don't feel particularly sorry for you because I had to recruit faculty, university faculty, to come to Fargo, North Dakota for 25 years. Um, anyway, now the next item on the agenda is patrol shorts conversation. Well, let me give you my opinion of this right now. I don't care if patrol officers wear shorts in any climate, any weather, any temperature, but I do not want flowers on the shorts. What do the rest of you think? Well, you tried it this summer. Is there a context for that? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, you tried it this summer, right? We did. We, uh, we, uh, you allowed for a trial period uh, over the summer. Uh, those that took part in the um, trial um, enjoyed it and uh, would like to see that be a permanent policy change. Uh, Gordy had asked me to bring this forward just to give feedback as to um, whether it was well received or not. Uh, if I had to guess, I would say there's probably maybe six officers that chose to wear shorts on um, on their work days uh, that were patrol uniform shorts. Uh, they didn't see it to be a challenge with equipment and carrying the necessary equipment they need to carry. Uh, they said it did keep them cooler and more comfortable. Uh, they would like to see that continue um, as if, if that is approved um, by this body and we make that formal uniform change, then um, you may see more taking advantage of that uh, as time moves on and it becomes more of a, maybe a normal um, observation instead of just a, 
and I promise there won't be flowers on. Um, That's good. But uh, <laughs> uh, no, I mean it'd be strict in line with what our uniform is. I mean they would have to be uh, navy, just like their pants have to uniform be navy. Uniform shirts, yeah, absolutely. You can buy so, them, I, I suspect. Yes. Uniform shirts. Yep. What do the rest of you think? I'm all for it. What do we need as far as a policy change? Does the chief well, have to write something? Yeah, yeah, yeah he would bring it. something to us that would be a formal policy change and we'd hold it. Everyone okay? We'll keep it a short conversation. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> About the need. Um, <laughs> from now on, I think you need to sit at this end of the table. For <laughs> the record, Pat wanted me to say that first. Nice. Leading into the conversation, I said absolutely not. So. <laughs> Uh, we think we think alike, Mike. <laughs> Mike is weak. <laughs> Maybe we don't think alike. I'll sit down if you don't bring your yards. The next item on the agenda is 2020 budget changes approved by the Common Council Police Department. Let's no no. Let's hold off on that. Okay. Um, and uh, Chief Owens has given us a written uh, document that that lists uh, approved, non-approved, um, I've had a conversation with the city administrator. Um, it does not make sense to me that the city administrator, uh, he's, he's responsible for preparing the budget, so this is the kind of thing he has to do. Uh, sits and goes through the, the police and fire department budgets and selects things uh, to be taken out and then discusses it with the chiefs. Um, I do understand if the city administrator would say to the commission, you have to take $50,000 out of each fire and police department, each budget. It's our responsibility to decide what comes out of the budget. For example, with the fire department, there are 19 items that were taken out of the budget, and over half of them were training opportunities. Uh, I, I, I'm uncomfortable with that. Uh, what distinguishes the police and fire departments in Marshfield, in my mind, as being exceptional, and I think they are, is the opportunity you have beyond what most departments do for training. Um, so, in conversation with, as a matter of fact, Steve was going to try and be here this morning. Um, we're going to begin in the next month or so conversations with the city about who is responsible for what, uh, the commission and the city. And this is going to be a case of point. It would seem to me that we should decide as a commission, because we're closer to it, what comes out of the budget if something has to come out. Um, and there are a number of other items that will be in that discussion about who decides what happens and how it happens. Stuff that's typically been done by the city, I think, belongs to the commission and so on. We'll sort all through that. So uh, uh, the city administrator suggested to me, well, uh, you know, my, my role is to present to the council a balanced budget. And sometimes we have to reduce the amount that's requested. Um, so I identify things that I think could come out of the budget. We go with that knowing full well that if the commission wants to shift money around, you guys are free to do that. We are free to adjust internally. Well, it seems to me to be better to do it the right way to begin with. So um, I don't think we want to get into what's happened this 2020 budget until we get a little further along in sorting through the sort of policy level stuff. Does that make sense? And in the meantime, if, for example, with the fire department where I have that list of items, if you decide you can find the money or you're willing to do without something in order to provide a training opportunity, come to us and you'll, we'll approve you doing that. Does that make sense? Yep. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. So are you thinking that 
the items that are taken out for this budget year are negotiable to go back in? Or are we, is this a done deal for this year? No, they, uh, they, don't, they don't go back in the city's budget, but the commission has the authority to shift money to put some of them back into the 2020 budget internally. And I think at times we do that with the budget resolution, or we may just do it, um, you know, I guess, and, and maybe this is a discussion for, for the future too, but sometimes I, I know that money gets shifted within the budget, you know, outside of your purview, but I mean within, I think, the scope of our abilities as, you know, the heads of the department, if we feel that, you know, we don't budget for every single training a year in advance that we know officers want to go to. We actually just switched our training this year to say, okay, we're allotting this dollar amount per officer, and that includes per diems and, and such, and uh, some officers may go over that, but there's going to be some that, you know, stay far under that amount, but at the end of the day, um, it is a balanced, you know, training budget, and if we needed, if we go over in training, I can assure you that we'll be under in some other way to where it will at the end of the day, at the end of the year, balance out. Yeah, Rick, some of what we're going to have to discuss is at what level and who is involved in making decisions. Uh, budget resolutions, in my mind, deal with separate accounts. That I'm not sure that the commission can do that, but within the general budget of the, that the city provides, the two million, three million, the commission has the authority to shift that money around. And we should want to inform the city, but we don't have to go to the city for permission. Yeah. Can I follow up to your comment, Andy? I think in the past I've always had an understanding that we were in charge of how the money is actually used. They award the money. And I think Andy's got a valid point. I, I think the messaging from the city was this year on both our budgets that we were supposed to be as lean as you could because of the deficits. But um, well, my thought would be is to dovetail with what Andy is talking about is I, I think we do as a commission have more responsibility in formulating this budget. In the past what we've done is we ask for pretty much everything that we need or we think that we require it. We send it down to City Hall and they work it out and they come where they see fit and then at that point it's the end of the discussion. But I think I think Andy's right. I think that needs to change. I think we need to as a commission we need to be more involved in the development of the budget and actually needs versus wants instead of throwing everything up to send it down to City Hall and waiting. So I, I agree with you. Okay. You know the, the the city if we use this here as an example, um, funds are very tight. Um, I understand that, and I don't think there's any city department that is getting all that they would like to have uh, because there simply aren't funds for it. I understand that, and, and I would like to present to this, you know, what, in my mind what we ought to be presenting to the city is a budget for what we really need. Uh, and if we have to cut from that, then we will do that. But I, I'm... I'd like the city to say to us, you have to cut X amount of dollars because we simply can't afford any more. And then we decide what's best to take out of the budget. Can I have just one follow-up question? Yeah. Scott, have you had any experience since you've been chief that they've cut anything from your EMS budget since it's an enterprise fund? Not really. Okay, because your comments stood out to me <laughs> that, you know, Say that he didn't look at it, and I understand that because we generate revenue, and we have expenses right. with that. But yeah, when I when I asked um, the city administrator um, about the different cuts and stuff, I asked specifically about EMS, and because it is that enterprise fund, he wasn't concerned with yeah. that at all. So yeah. he really doesn't look at it. That's just a, a profit yeah. loss that you're running. Yeah, the only thing that gets removed out of the EMS fund would be. Um, Projects that are split 64 yeah, or 50 between 50. the two. Yeah, right. between right. the two different dead service. That can right, facility. but other than that, no. It, EMS is typically, uh, if we eliminate anything, it's in house. Okay. Because of a change in the process or something. Okay. Or you look at the revenue flow and decide yep. you can. Exactly. Yeah. All right. 
All right, um, fire department uh, activities, training reports, and correspondence packet. Chief. All right, um, so the month of November um, was actually a, a fairly busy month for us. Um, there were several fire safety talks and station tours throughout the month. Uh, we wrapped up fire prevention week activities. Uh, there were uh, bikes awarded. Uh, there were pizza parties. Uh, there was firefighter for a day, uh, a lot of different things. Um, every year when the fire prevention committee goes to the schools uh, to talk fire safety with the kids, uh, they're given homework assignments and contests and based on results of the contests, a uh, certain group uh, wins a pizza party, um, six kids become firefighter for a day, uh, we have a couple of bikes that are, are given away uh, and so that was a bulk of this month's um, uh, doings. On 11 A and B, um, the uh, trainer, the representative from Pierce was here uh, and provided training to all three shifts on uh, New Engine 3. Uh, that is slated to go online um, this week. Uh, everybody is, is fairly comfortable driving it. Um, and uh, it's, it's a different uh, engine than our others as far as operations. Uh, so we're just making sure that everybody is very comfortable with it. Uh, 11B, we had interviews for a new firefighter, or new firefighters. Um, and uh, we interviewed uh, six individuals and uh, Three of them are currently um, having reference checks uh, finalized and uh, offers are, are being extended. Uh, you'll also note in there the monthly statistics. Uh, there's several checks, um, uh, thank you cards, notes. Uh, you'll notice also there is um, the sale of old engine three. Uh, we get nowhere near what the PD gets for a Tahoe. <laughs> we got $2,800 for yeah. the engine. Um, that would be worth that much in scrap. Yep. Yeah. And uh, actually, it's, it's kind of funny because one of our firefighters, uh, Dave Patton, who's actually getting ready to retire in uh, February, uh, at least that's his indication, his son bought it. Uh, so it's staying in town. Um, I think right now it's being stored at a... The Marshall Bus Company, where Dave works part time and, and his son Travis works. So, um, if you see it around the city, that's why. <laughs> so. oh, I, I know the status on that was standby. There was some really good commentary on that in one of our reports. I mean, when, when, it, when do have we actually rolled that thing out to use? Full three? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> on an actual fire, it's been quite a few years. I mean, like 20? No, it's uh, probably. <laughs> Yeah, you know, probably 10. 10 years, okay. Yeah. So you just would fire it up once in a while and... We would take it out. Um, if we had a fire out in a non-hydrated area, mm -hmm. so out like on Lincoln or Manville area, that carried our water tanker. Okay. So that would be a primary response. We'd have to drop our, our basket and stuff. But uh, yeah, it had... And if mid-state training uh, or training at the training center, if we're okay. going to do a live burn, okay. uh, so we would have an injury. Yeah, it would get used here and there, uh, but it, it just got to the point that it was too old and it failed its tests and leaks everywhere, so. No tears went left. <laughs> Not too many, you know. We had a couple of retired guys come in and take pictures because that was their engine when they were out, you know, when they responded and stuff, so. Um, Sounds to me like what's happening to me. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, <laughs> um, that's about all for the activity report. I'd be happy to answer any other questions and ask that you accept a place up on Yes. Uh, probably just a typo, but on uh, the 8th and the 13th and the 14th, they all list the red shift as being um, participating in training. I take it all three shifts. Oh, you said yes. got it. Uh, that was a copy and paste. And okay. I tried to tried to get it done before the Thanksgiving weekend, so it was great. No problem. Yes. It would be red, blue, green, or red, green, blue, whichever yeah, way the shift worked. <laughs> Good catch. A quick well, question. Yeah. The, this graphic? Yeah. What are the real numbers? We've got the percentages, but I don't know what the numbers are. I know that the dark blue is 29.41%. I don't know if that's 140 or 3. Does that make sense? It does. And actually, the program that I well, use. Well, next time you do it, just. Yep. The program that I use for that, they just changed their graphic thing, and uh, it, it actually shows the numbers uh, 
now, so. That's fine. Just wanted to remind you. Um, we have, um, did, we, did we have to vote on approving this? No. Well, thank you for your report, Scott. Uh, you have um, meeting, financial review, and attendance schedule to the Common Council in your packet. I would suggest that you pull those out and get them in your next year's calendar, which I don't have yet. Um, is there anything else that we need to deal with this morning before we go to close session? All right, uh, I understand that I am um, prescribed to read this. Consideration of motion to adjourn into closed session pursuant to section 19.85 paren 1, close paren, paren C, close paren. Wisconsin statutes considering employment promotion, compensation or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the government body has jurisdiction, juris, I can't say it, or exercises responsibility, specifically to conduct performance review of police and fire chief. I need a motion to go into closed session. Thank you, is there a second? Thank second. you. Uh, this requires a roll call. Gershman. Yes. <coughs> Earl. Yes. Myers. Yes. Meese. Yes. Keel, yes. We are now in closed session and we